identify the whole thing. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and blessed them, and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years, and begot a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Seth lived 105 years, and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years, and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mehalalel. After he begot Mehalalel, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. Mehalalel Lived, seven, lived 65 years and begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mehalalel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mehalalel were 895 years and he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and, and he was not, for God took him. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord had cur has cursed. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Thank you, Reed. So I wanted to go ahead and read that and go through that. There's not a, a ton. I mean, we could spend some time going through and picking out certain things to talk about there, but I really wanted to get into chapter 6 because that's going to be the meat of what we're going to study. But still, some things in chapter 5, namely, that it's the genealogies of Seth. And why is it the genealogies of Seth? What is important about that? As opposed to Adam and Eve's other kids. Asking for the class, people in the class here. Yeah, it's, a, it's a going to be the lineage of Christ. And that's where I made a fundamental mistake last time when I got, we got to verse 23. We talked about Enoch there. And we compared it to, you know, Cain, wicked Cain, having a son named Enoch in chapter 4. Well, it can't be the same Enoch, again, because we're talking about the lineage of Seth in chapter 5. Now, is it a common thing that they shared names? There's, you know, all through the Bible we see where people, where names are used repetitively, really, for whatever reason it might be, but it's not the same Enoch. So, unrighteous Cain did not have righteous Enoch. I just want to make sure I cleared that up from my mistake last week. So, some of the things we noticed is they lived a long time. Some people ask, why? The Bible doesn't tell us why. But we can guess some things as to what could be, and again, Stressing what could be, um, they had a job to do. And part of that job was to, to plenish the earth or fill the earth. So if they were living a normal lifespan, like we live 70 years, three score and ten, that'd be very, very difficult to do. And so they, it was of necessity that they had to live a long time to do what God wanted them to do is filling the earth. Two, um, some people um, 
you know, this is pre-flood. Some people have a theory they throw out there called the canopy theory. When we talked about in creation about the waters above the waters, the firmament in the midst of the waters. Y'all remember that discussion? The idea, again, possibly there was a thick water layer in the atmosphere. If that were true, part of the things that does um, add to our aging process is the radiation coming from the sun. Allowing men to live longer. Again, very much that's a big if, big possible. This man's reasoning, don't know that to be a fact whatsoever. And then the idea, if someone has mentioned some of the things I read, that it could have been a holdover from the access they had to eating the, the, the tree of life. Again, that's a big if, we don't know that. But I do think of things like when, um, when Moses went to go receive the law, he was in the presence of God, and his face shone for a while after he came off the mountain, that it did fade gradually from him being in the presence of God. So can you make the comparison, perhaps there was a lingering effect to access to the tree of life? Again, perhaps there might be some precedent for that. But again, we don't know, because the Bible just doesn't say. They lived that long because God wanted them to live that long. They had, there was a purpose behind it. The purpose maybe is just hidden from us. Other than that, I don't know of a, a ton to say about chapter 5. I could go through and we could talk about the names and what the names meant. I just don't know if there's a lot to that of value uh, as opposed to the practical lessons that we could get to in chapter 6. Um, the one thing that I did I quiz a class on before we started the film was in verse 32 when it talks about Noah's children that are mentioned, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, I asked which one was the oldest, which was the middle child, and which one was the youngest. Western way of thinking is you typically list things in order, starting at the top and going down, as far as age goes. But the Bible is not written that way. Sometimes people are listed in, in, in order of importance. And that kind of probably happens to be the case here because Shem, although listed first, is the middle child. And again, I ask the question, why was he listed first then? If it has to do with importance. Class? Silence here. <laughs> why was Shim listed first? Because who was gonna who was gonna be his ascendant? Christ was gonna come through him. So he's listed for importance. So how do I know he's not the oldest? If you look in um, chapter 8, verse 24, it tells us there that Ham was the youngest when he's caught in a sin of um, coming upon his father Noah after he was drunk. Instead of just covering him up, he went and got his brothers. And it's when they're discussing that sin, he's called out as the youngest in that sin. And then later on in chapter 10, verse 21, Japheth is described as the eldest. So Japheth is the oldest. Ham's the youngest, Shem is the middle child, and through him is going to come the lineage of Christ. So at the end of chapter 5, Noah is stated at being 500 years old when he has Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, again, this list is here who came first. We know now through a little bit of study that Japheth came first. So at 500 years old, he has Japheth. Noah is going to live to be 950 years. So he's going to live 450 years after this time right here. Again, not the oldest guy who ever lived. That was Methuselah, 969 years. They lived for a very, very long time back there. Anything else y'all can think of? Chapter 5? Because I didn't want to spend a great deal of time on that. What's Katie telling me now? Ah, she's answering questions. Let me do Christ. Very good, Katie. You were right. <laughs> Let me do Christ. <laughs> I have to look at my phone there if they're answering questions via text. And Doyle, again, if you have questions, feel free to text them. I'll try to look down at my phone every once in a while. If you have my number, if not, send them to Facebook. Doyle will raise his hand and stop me back there. So chapter 6 now is going to begin the preparation for the flood. Let's read uh, verses 1 through 4, chapter 6. And it came to pass... When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, 
that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wise, all of which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive, shall not always strive with man, for he is also flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. There is a chunk of stuff going on in the first four verses, and a lot of stuff that's interpreted incorrectly. So we're going to go through and try to discuss that to the best of our ability and clear up some things that I have heard people teach wrong or believe wrong, just in, not even in a church setting, just casual conversations um, about these first few verses. First off, who is it talking about? It's describing, I hate to use this term, race, but two different tribes, two different groups of people. It's talking about the sons of God, verse 2, and the sons of men. Roughly so, yes. Uh, if you didn't hear Jennifer, she says, you're talking about Cain's descendants and Seth's descendants. Yes. To make it even more general or more accurate, those who are choosing to follow God and those who are not. Um, I know that, uh, again, misconception number one is people see the term sons of God. Context, we talked about this in the first part of Genesis about when it talks about heaven. Which heaven is it referring to? The context tells you if it's heaven where the birds fly, heaven where the stars are, or heaven where God is. Context will tell you when you see a term sons of God who it is. Turn over quick. Um, turn over to someone, um, Job chapter 1, verse 6. I'm going to use my phone. Bible here. here. Someone has it. They want to read it. Do we determine? Can they hear if you read it from the audience? Can they hear it? If someone's got Job 1 6, go ahead and read it. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Okay, so now the context, you see that term, sons of God. So the sons of God came to present themselves to who? The Lord. And who came with them? Satan. Who are the sons of God in that context? Angels, the people in the heavenly realm. It has to be because Satan is there. They're in the presence of God. There are things in the context that tell you who those people are. So if you just read Job 1.6 and you make the determination, oh, sons of God means those in the heavenly realm, and you jump back to Genesis chapter 6, and you see the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and they were fair, and they took them to wise. What, where do you get to real quick? Angels coming down and marrying human women. Well, you know, heartbreaker. That, that's not true. That's not true at all. So we're, how do we know that? How do we prove that? Let's look at some other things. Let's go to um, the Gospel of John, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 12. Someone got that? Uh, and read that, if they would, please. Well, there's something here in verse 3. Go ahead. Cody's, can I hope he speak up loud enough so I can hear you? Cody's got some comments about verse 3. Chapter 6, verse 3, he says, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. With man. And that would be because of the reference of the children of God, the Son of God, and all of the True. True, but I guess people could say if they were going to push their belief that the sons of God in this context of Genesis 6 was angels, that it's some, they talk about the Nephilim. The men of renown, the giants, that they were a special breed, that were giant, true giants, as we think of, like, you know, uh, David and Goliath, the sons of Anakim or sons of Anak. Not Anakim. It was Anakim. I get Star Wars mixed up, so we can watch this in a separate way, but it's, it's, um, it's actually the sons of Anak. But I think they were actually called in, in the old of the Anakim as well, right? Right? Yeah. Anyway, someone correct me if I'm wrong. I was wrong last week, I'll be wrong this week, so correct me. But. Cody's right, but going on to the Gospel of John, verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But as many as received him, speaking of Jesus, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So, who's the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12, referring to? Angels or men? Men. So we see right away that, again, context is going to determine, is it man or is it angels? And I have a bunch, a bunch of other references here. Romans 8, 14. 
Matthew 5, 9, Galatians 4, verses 5 through 7, all talking about becoming, uh, how do you become a son of God is being obedient to him, referring to mankind. Then the, the, the nail in the coffin for this case is um, Mark chapter 12, verse 25. Mark chapter 12, verse 25. In this context, um, the Sadducees are trying to trip up Jesus with a questioning, uh, talking about spirits and whatnot, um, talking about you know, the, man, the, the woman who is married to a man, he dies, the brother marries her, goes to all seven of her brothers in the resurrection, you know, whose husband is she gonna be? They were trying to question Jesus, trying to try to disprove the resurrection. And Jesus answers them and goes in 24, goes, you do err, or err, not knowing the scriptures, neither the power of God, was in the 25. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. So that verse right there dispelled this whole idea about the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6 being angels and coming down and intermarrying with man. That is not what's being talked about. Is that clear as mud? Do you have any questions? Too, that the angels are not married in any way. Anyway, they're spiritual beings. They have no desire <laughs> for a spouse or anything like that. They're just, it's just not part of their makeup. So again, that's just man's reasoning and, and with their limitations that we have being men, reading this and go, oh, that's what makes sense. It's not true. I hope that makes sense. Um, and then to Cody's point as well, verse 3, he says, you know, where God says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. For he is also flesh, and his, his days shall be numbered 120 years. And we're going to talk about that right there a little bit, but continuing on with this one thought, verse 4, where it says there were giants in the earth in those days. Again, people going back to verse 2 and 3, people say, see, these angels came down and married the sons of men, and they created these monster offspring." Again, that's not true. Um, the, I, the word giant right there actually can be translated to, to fall upon or attack. It could have been just like um, Avengers or people who were, um, say again? <laughs> bullies, right? Yeah, we have to get bullies, right? It could have just been referring to people like that. Even when you think about the spies going into the land of Canaan, and they said they're giants in the land, the word grasshoppers are on our side. Now, again, could they have been little giants because of David and Goliath? Yes, they could have. The sons of Anak were there. But it also could have been the idea was these were big, bad people with walled silly cities. We were just grasshoppers in our sight to them. That's what they're getting across there. Not that there's, again, this crossbreeding between angels and man and this special race of people. I hope that makes sense. Backing up to verse 3. God said he's not going to deal with man. He's not going to strive with man. For he is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. What do y'all think that means? I'll take an answer from audience. Okay, 120 years to the flood. 120 years to the flood. Okay. Anybody else have another idea? Is there, have you, okay, have you, has anybody else heard of anything else? People are only going to live about 120 years. He's going to start cutting down their age even more. Sure. Possible as well, right? Um, is there anywhere else in the Bible that talks about how long it is to the flood? Not that I can find. Now, I've, I've been told, like, that I've read the interpretation that this is 120 years, 120 years of flood. Let me just throw some what is at you here, though. Think about this. Because the, the, the question I would have for that is who's God talk, who's talk, who's God talking to here in verse 3? Talking amongst himself? Is he directing that to somebody? I mean, with the implication that, that maybe he's talking to Noah? The reason I say all that because how where do we leave Noah off? How old is he in verse 32? 500? How old is he when he goes into the ark? Chapter 7, verse 11. I 
How old? Six. Six hundred. So a hundred years from the time it's talking about him having his boys to the time he enters the ark. So the 120 years, it would have to be God making the statement 20 years prior to Noah having his first child. If we're talking in a literal years concept right there. Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. God could have just said it. I, in 120 years, I'm done with man. Noah has his kids 20 years later. God then talks to him in chapter 6 later on. In the whole context of the latter half of 6, when God's saying, I want you to build an ark, it's written as if God is giving the instructions in real time. And then, what does he say in those instructions? We'll get to it here in a little bit. And I want you to go in that ark with your sons and their wives. So if he's giving him the instructions at that time to build the ark, guess what? His sons are born. His sons are old enough to have wives. Unless God was talking again in the, in the future aspect of like, hey, when your kids get older and they have wives, this is going to the ark. Again, I'm not sure. But that 120 years, it's, just, it's perplexing to me because it's just not, again, we're not told exactly. Now, could it be the idea that he's going to start limiting man's age? Because if you take it how the King James reads, that's kind of how it reads. That's how it's read, it reads to me. Could be wrong about that. But you do see man's age start to drastically decrease after the flood. They don't live this 900, 800 years anymore. They're, they're, they start getting whittled down to around 100 years. You think about Moses. There are some who are recorded who did live longer. There are some who are less, but they, they do, they drop down to that that range there. Cody, did you have anything, you remember anything from class but at preaching school or anything that could shed some light on that? No. <laughs> but <laughs> Thank you so much, sir, Cody. <laughs> I mean, my thought is, I mean, they're transgressing. The, the Son of the God, the holy men, are Marrying themselves to the daughters of men, mm -hmm. of men. And so you have a transgression going on there as far as an unequal yoking between believer and non believer, obedient and disobedient. And at this point, God God takes no pleasure in that. And so if men had been living for seven, eight, nine hundred years before then, probably some of it has to do with the fact that. There was a pleasing aspect to their obedience. Now they're not obedient. And so, you know, you cut it down some more. I mean, it cuts down even further after at most and everything. Yep. I mean, David said in Psalm 19, verse 10. Three score and 10. Man, there's strength for school. Yeah. Which is kind of where we're at today, right? 70, 80 years. All the man's advancements, everything else, we're still 70, 80 years. So, again, I'm not trying to push anything there. The God could have very well had this conversation with himself 120 years out before, so I'm going to cut man off at 120 years. That could be, that's what Gary seems to indicate in his notes. That's what a lot of people seem to think. There's nothing else in the Bible that really I can find that backs that up that I could find. So, again, that's just me, right? You look at the time frame of when Noah had to build the ark. Chapter 5 ends with 500 years. He goes into it in chapter 7 at 600. So he had 100 years there. It talks about when we're going to read the latter half of 6. Again, when God is telling him, hey, I want you to build a garden. This is how I want you to build it. And I want you to go in with their sons and their wives. It talks about like they're in that state of being married at that time, which actually condenses the time for Noah to build the ark down to like 50, 60, 70 years. For him to have kids, for him to have kids that age that could have been going in the ark. So, again, all this kind of piece of stuff together that I find interesting, but nothing that I would be dogmatic or press about. Yes, go ahead. I do know that um, common belief uh, amongst people is that the decrease of the age in men um, after the flood has to do with the fact that it's rain now and so the atmosphere has changed so much that it's the fact that water. Right. That's a canopy theory that I was talking about, I alluded to earlier, that people believe that. Right. Whatever the case may be, 
the aid demand did decrease. That was God's will. Now, could God have brought it about through a natural mechanism like having a canopy theory in place and having it fall to the earth? It's all possible. Don't know. But these things are good because what these things do to me is even if the answers aren't readily available or available at all, it makes you look. It makes you study. It makes you say, hey, I've always thought this. Let me look at this and see if I can prove myself right or wrong. Any time spending God's word, whatever the goal of it might be, is good time. It, it's, it, you're going to learn something that's going to help you be a better Christian. So take these things that are curiosities and use them to help motivate you to study, to look and see, um, and see what you can find. Okay, that's through chapter 4. Let's read chapter um, 5 through 8. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and creepeth, and the creepeth, creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of God. We're going to spend some time, hopefully, we're going to do good. We're going to, ooh, we're going to do good. We're going to talk about grace and faith and, um, and how the, the example of Noah sheds some light on how grace and faith should be interpreted for me and you. So, man is doing wickedly. God chooses to reveal how he felt about it by saying it repented uh, God that he made man. What is repentance? We talked about repentance and salvation. What is repentance? It leads to a change of action, right? So as God said, that did God, again, God knows everything that's going to happen. God knew when he made man how it's going to come about. Why do you think God is choosing to repent? God is trying to personify himself so that we can understand him. That is what he's trying to, that's what he's trying to get across. He's trying to say that he's trying to give himself human characteristics, even though he's and that's what he's trying to get across with saying he repented it. It made him sorry. We're going to condense stuff because I want to get through it. Chapter 6. Verse 8 tells us that no. Grace is thrown about very loosely nowadays. Grace covers everything. Verse 22 of chapter 6. Grace. Now Noah had a choice. He could have not done what God That extended his grace to us by telling him, telling us judgment is coming, wrath is coming, punishment is coming. But if you want to avoid punishment, the punishment of hell, this is what you have to do. Now we have a choice. We either do what he says and we avoid the punishment or we ignore it. And we face the punishment. But even, but even though grace is extended in the Old Testament here and in the New Testament to me and you, it still can and does require action on our part. I want to make sure that you get that. 
And we'll, we'll talk about them some more as we go through this. Um, let's keep on reading. 9 through 13. These are the generations of Noah, and Noah was a just, a righteous man, and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. You'll see that expressed before, um, the idea of walking with God. I can't help but think of, uh, of Cody's discussion that he's going to go into in 1 John, where it talks about us walking in the light. As long as we walk in the light, we're in fellowship with God. And we're doing right to the best of our ability. And it says that Noah begat his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them from the earth. So now we're told that Noah has found grace in his eyes, and now God is building the case for what he's getting ready to do. And why is he getting ready to destroy the earth? It's corrupt. Every thought of their heart is on violence. God is not going to stand for that. He's going to punish the violence, the corruption, the wickedness right here in the old generation. Let's keep on going. Verse 14. We're actually going to go to the end of the chapter. We only got probably less than 10 minutes, so I want to make a few applications in this section. So he gives him instructions of what to do. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, rooms thou shalt make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion that thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50, the height of it 30 cubits. And a window shalt thou make to the ark, and a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou put in the side thereof, and the lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life. From under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee I will establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou, and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives, uh, with thee. And every living creature, and every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, shall be male and female. Of the fowls after their kind, and cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee. Keep them alive. And take thou unto thee all of the food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. In our verse 22, which we've already mentioned. And thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now I know you've heard lessons and you've heard sermons on this before. But where God's destruction, uh, destruction, was God's instructions about the coming destruction, very clear and explicit. Were they kind of loosey-goosey that you know, Noah could go and build the ark kind of how he wanted? He could choose kind of whatever wood he wanted? Did he put more than one window? I mean, was all that just up to Noah with God just kind of giving him general instructions? No. God was very specific on what Noah had to do. And did Noah do most of it, some of it, part of it? Verse 22. He did it all. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now let's talk a little bit about the time we have left about grace and faith and the example we can learn from Noah. We've already mentioned that people take the idea of grace saying that grace is going to cover any and all things, which is true to an extent, kind of like the lie of Satan, right? It is true, but there has to be repentance, there has to be a change of life, there has to be an obedience to God, not under our terms, but under God's terms. So, let's look at, because uh, uh, Noah's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11 real quick. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. start in verse 6. It says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, 
being warned of God of things not yet as not seen as yet, moved with fear, preparing an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and he became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. And we talked about this before, but when the Bible says by faith, what does that mean? How do we get that faith? Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith went by hearing, hearing by the word of God. What we just read back in Genesis chapter 6, verses 9 through 22, there is the word of God telling Noah what he must do. So I'm trying to draw a picture for you here. God extended his grace to Noah. The way he extended that grace to Noah was he told him what to do to save himself. If you want to be saved, this is what you have to do. You build an ark, you build out a gopher wood, you build it so long, so tall, so wide, three stories, one door on the side, one window on the top, and you line it with pitch within without. That's what you have to do. And Noah did that. And by Noah doing that, he saved himself. Now think about that, how it applies to me and you. When God tells me and you how to save ourselves from this world, he tells us that we have to believe. He tells us that we have to repent. He tells us that we have to confess. And he tells us that we have to be baptized to have our sins washed away in order to be saved, in order to be placed inside the ark, if you will, be placed inside the church, the, the, the New Testament equivalent of the ark, spiritually speaking, we have no more right to change the type of wood, the lengths, the widths, the heights, not tarring with them without the amount of number of stories. We have no more right to do that. You know what Noah did? If you ask somebody today, and said if Noah would have made the ark out of cedar wood instead of gopher, would he have been acceptable to God? If they're an honest person, they'd say there's no way. Because it, verse 22 would apply then. He wouldn't have done all that God told him to do. And yet, when you come down to present day, me and you right here, you ask the everyday person, you have to be baptized to be saved. They're going to say, no. No, you don't. We don't have that authority. We don't have that right. We can't make that argument. They also want to tie in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And this is a big verse if you're studying with somebody in the denominational world. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. People say, for by grace you are saved through faith. And it's not of yourselves that get to God, not of works as any man should boast. Grace and faith. They, they say that term or those two terms together and they think that absolves man of doing anything. I'm not here saying that what we do, we earn heaven. That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying we're trying to be like Noah. He has told us what to do. By his grace, he has told us what to do. By faith, we receive that and then we act upon it. And if we do everything that he tells us to do, we can expect to receive the same reward that Noah did. But Noah couldn't come out of the ark and say, look at what I did. Look how good I am. He was simply doing what he was told to do. And when we obey God in order to be saved, that is all we're doing. We're unprofitable servants. Simply doing what is our duty to do. And that, I think, is the main lesson. There's a bunch of other stuff that we could get out of chapter 6. But that is the main lesson that I want you to take home from chapter 6.